All right, uh, get your notes on the integumentary system and we'll go through those notes and look at the different slides that we would use in lecture normally. Uh, the integument we just typically will call the skin. Um, the integument is an organ, an aggregation of tissues that performs a specific function. Uh, and we can look at some. Let's just look at this next slide. Here's your integument. <clears throat> so we talked about an organ, an aggregation of tissues that performs a specific function. And we can talk about a system, a group of organs operating together to perform specialized functions like the skin, nervous uh, uh, system, digestive system, respiratory system. It's a group of organs and the organs are made up of tissues. The one that we're looking at today is called the skin or the integument also called the cutis. Um, approximately 3,000 square inches of surface area. Now that's a ballpark number because you know that people are not all the same size. So that's just an average ballpark for the population. Some functions of this integument. Helps to maintain body temperature by uh, having fat there, which helps to insulate you from heat loss. Um, also, it, you know, you have blood supply underneath the skin, and the, we'll look at that in the dermis and the uh, subcutaneous areas. Uh, vasodilation can warm your skin to get rid of heat or reducing blood flow to the skin uh, conserves, you know, body temperature and you have, you're a little bit colder. Uh, covers the body to protect the body from dehydration, bacteria, and UV light. We talked about that with epithelial tissues. So that does protect you and your underlying tissues. Receive stimuli from the environment. Talked about that also. Hot, cold, textures, uh, you know, pressure, this type of stuff. Uh, different types of stimuli. Excretes water and salts like sweat. Uh, and even some, oil, some oils like sebum from uh, oil glands. Synthesizes vitamin D3, which is converted by the kidneys into the hormone calcitrol which is essential for absorption of calcium and phosphorus by the small intestine. Now, it does that. You need to have about 15, I think, 15 minutes of sunlight per day to make sure that you maintain that. And usually most people are exposed some way or another to the outside. So getting some type of sun, sun exposure helps your skin to produce this vitamin D, which will help form the calcitrol so you can absorb calcium and phosphorus uh, in your diet and storage of nutrients. Skin has a nutritive value um, because it is, you know, biomolecules. The structure. If you look at this picture, you can see that the structure over here on the left is the epidermis. It means upon the dermis. The dermis, which is below that, that's why the one, the layer above is called the epidermis, upon the dermis. And then below the dermis is the hypodermis or the uh, superficial layer, subcutaneous layer. They say superficial fascia is down here, but the hypodermis is um, the lowest layer, okay? And it's going to contain adipose. <clears throat> Let's look at the epidermis, the upper layer first. Here's the epithelium, the epidermis. So five layers of keratinocytes. Keratin, that's a waterproofing protein that toughens and waterproof, and it's cells. Keratin cells, so these cells contain keratin. Starting at the bottom, we have the stratum basal, it implies the base layer. Stratum's a layer, basal implies base, or it can be called the stratum Germinativum, G-E-R-M-I-N-A-T-I-V-U-M. -I -I it means germinating layer. This is an area of rapid cell division that produces new cells that are pushed toward the surface. And as they go toward the surface, they dehydrate, die, and are sloughed off. So this is constantly producing new cells. So it says three to five rows of cells the lowest layer of the continually dividing cells. This is the lowest layer of your stratified squamous epithelium. 
<clears throat> they're cuboidal to columnar in shape. If you remember, that's how they were described earlier. This layer of cells forms folds called epidermal ridges. So let's look at the epidermal ridges. See, here's this uh, layer here. See, it's a dark layer. That's the stratum basal. It goes up and down, and it forms a little wiggly pattern called epidermal ridges or fingerprints. This folding extends down into the underlying dermis as dermal papilla, and here they are. The papilla means projection. So these are projections from the dermis. See this layer below the epidermis is called the dermis. These are dermal projections, dermal papilla. This layer also contains some cells called melanocytes. See, here's the basal again. There's melanocytes. Mel melanin is pigment, the pigment for your skin. So it gives you your skin tone. See, so melanocytes or pigment cells. These cells produce melanin, a brown, yellow brown, or black pigment. The amino acid, AA stands for amino acid, tyrosine. T-Y-R-O-S-I-N-E is needed to make melanin pigments. These pigments are deposited into the cells of the stratum germinativum and stratum spinosum naturally. Stratum spinosum is the one up on top. And you see these little dots? That's the melanin that's been deposited in these cells. These pigments, yeah, that uh, exposure to UV light causes extra amounts of melanin to be deposited into the cells. So it's going to stimulate these melanocytes to make more melanin, and that's what a tan is. And that extra melanin protects the DNA from the damaging effects of UV light. Skin cancers or malignant melanomas are the result of excessive exposure to UV light. So overexposure for years and years, and years can cause enough damage where you get what's called malignant melanoma, cancer of the melanocytes. And you can have um, benign melanoma or malignant melanoma. You can be killed by malignant melanoma, by skin cancer. So you want to try to put on sunblock to help prevent that UV light from getting down into your, your cells themselves. It'll prevent you from tanning, but it also saves your skin for later in life. If you tan a lot right now, it's not going to show up till you get older. My father-in-law, when I first met him, uh, he's Caucasian, and he looked like a potato. He was so brown. And I told him, you're getting too much sun. And he said, no, I have some Indian blood, which he, he thought he had Indian blood in him, but he, he didn't have any. One of his cousins married a Cherokee lady, and that's how he thought he had Indian blood in him, but he didn't. So for the last 15, 20 years, he's had to have melanomas taken off of his skin. And he's got plenty more that are going to have to come off from now on. So he did a lot of skin damage when he was younger, and now he's paying for it. So try to protect yourself right now, and you won't have to uh, worry about that later on. Um, freckles are concentrated areas of melanin. So if you have freckles, those are areas where melanin is being produced in larger amounts and just little spots. Now, you can get sunburned. My brother got sunburned laying on a a uh, surfboard in Hawaii, and now he has freckles on his back. So it stimulated those melanocytes, and they, from that point on, produced more melanin, and he, and he has freckles on his back. The blank there is albino, A-L-B-I-N-O, means a total lack of pigmentation. Albino is where you have white hair, and you have a pink iris, because the reason you it's pink because it doesn't have any pigment in it, and it's pink because of the capillaries in that muscle. That's the only reason you have color on your on your albino, color on your iris. And the skin tends to be light pink because of the capillaries and the blood flow in the skin uh, below the you know below the epidermis, and blood is red. It doesn't have anything to do with uh, whether you're albino or not. Blood is hemoglobin, and the heme is a red pigment. So. Uh, that's what happens. Number two, the stratum spinosum. Stratum spinosum. It means spiny layer. Eight to ten rows of cells. The layer of cells are bound by desmosomes. And when this tissue is processed, the cells shrink a little bit. 
and you see the desmosomes elements between the cells. So it gives the cells a spiny appearance or a prickly appearance, like they have a little, little sticking out of them. So they named that layer stratum spinosum. So I have a processing of a skin section to make a histology slide dehydrates the cells and causes them to shrink. The shrinkage causes the desmosomes to be pulled tightly between the cells and gives them a spiny or prickly appearance. And you can see that on there. Thus the naming of the layer, the stratum spinosum. The next layer up is called the stratum granulosum. It means the granular layer. And you look at these cells and they appear to have a lot of granules in there. So in your notes, three to five rows of cells, these cells no longer divide, but instead begin producing keratohyalin, which will be converted into keratin. That's the waterproofing, toughening protein that's going to be deposited in the cells. Keros means horn or tough, tough, a water-resistant protein that uh, as the cells begin to die. So as they begin to die, keratin is deposited in them to waterproof them and toughen them so that you have a, a friction-resistant surface when these cells die all the way. Now, we don't have the stratum lucidum. It's L-U-C-I-D-U-M. Several rows of dead cells. Uh, it's between the stratum granulosum and the stratum corneum. Um, can be seen in sections of palms and soles. This is where you have a lot of wear and tear, a lot of pressure. The soles of your feet, a cross section of that skin would show a clear layer of cells there. Uh, and a cross section of your palm would show it. The skin is thicker there, all right? And so we're not going to really get into that one. We're not going to consider that to be part of our layering, okay? Number five is the stratum corneum. Corneum or cornu means tough, and so, uh, or horn. Horn implies tough. Fifteen to thirty rows of flattened, dead, keratinized cells, which are continually sloughed off. So bacteria don't have a real good... Uh, method of getting to you because when they get on these cells and you wash your hands or something rubs, these cells slough off and only the ones that were underneath those cells, now they're on top. And as they try to get underneath those cells, they get sloughed off. And so the continually sloughing off of these cells prevents bacteria from actually having easy access to the underlying tissue of your body. So the only way they can get in is if you have a like a pen or a nail or a tooth or something lacerate your skin and it opens it up to where bacteria can get in that, that opening, get down to you to set up an infection. The dermis, the connective tissue, there it is, located just below the epidermis because remember epidermis means upon the dermis. So the tissue below the epidermis is called the, the dermis. Contains collagen, elastic and reticular fibers as well as numerous blood vessels. Look at all those blood vessels in there. Remember, epithelial tissues are avascular. They don't have a blood supply. The nutrients and water have to diffuse and osmose through the layers to get to these cells, you know, from the dermis into the epidermis. Uh, blood flowing through these vessels gives Caucasians their reddish skin color. So it's the, uh, it's the, um, Possession or, or or having these capillaries below the epidermis is what gives you know people the part of their skin tone is the blood. Now you notice this epidermis is divided into the top layer called the papillary layer. So papillary layer, the upper fifth of the dermis, consists of loose connective tissue, contains the dermal papilla, and there they are. See their little projections from the dermis. It's like an egg crate. Um, capillaries, yeah, a lot of capillaries in there. Some things called Meissner corpuscles, which are, uh, um, they're called corpuscles of light touch now, and they're usually up in these, up in here, like up in here, in these papilla, that's where you usually find them. This slide doesn't have structures themselves shown. We will see a picture of them on a model in just a minute. And the reticular layer, so the lower four-fifths is called the reticular layer. <clears throat> contains collagen, reticular and elastic fibers, some adipose is in there, hair follicles, here they are, producing hairs, oil glands, these are sebaceous glands, these are oil glands, 
uh, and here are some sweat glands. Let's see, here's a sweat gland here. Collagen and elastic fibers give the skin its strength and elasticity. All right, I told you collagen was uh, strong and it gave your tissues their firmness, whether it's bone or it's a skin, it gives it the firmness. That's why you get those collagen injections in lips and stuff that makes them puffy. Um, <clears throat> elastic fibers give resiliency. Uh, pregnancy stretch marks and weight fluctuations result in broken collagen fibers. Uh, scars result from extra collagen fibers being laid down to repair the stretching. The same laying down of excess collagen fibers occurs as the result of a laceration of the skin. Now, our, our next slide shows this, um, this pattern of these collagen fibers in this uh, dermis. And these are called lines of cleavage. So where it says bundles of collagen and elastic fibers are laid out in patterns over the surface of the body. These patterns can be seen and are called lines of cleavage. Okay, lines of cleavage. Plastic surgeons make incisions along these lines to drastically reduce the evidence of scarring. Now, here's what plastic surgeons do. See, these collagen and elastic fibers are laid down parallel, and they will cut parallel, and they'll remove something like this, and then the two pieces just slide together, like right here. It would be tissue is removed, and so you have a very thin little line of collagen laid down. But if you get a cut across these collagen fibers, like this, when collagen is laid down, it's laid down across that, that cut area, and so it becomes thick, and that's where you get the scar. A scar is excess collagen that's laid down in that area. Okay, so I have, um, let's move to the next slide. Subcutaneous layer or hypodermis. The subcutaneous layer or the hypodermis means below the dermis. It says, um, attaches the skin to bone and muscle. Yes, it does. Contains pacinian corpuscles. Pacinian are the same thing as Meisner's, and that's these right here. Um, uh, they, now they call them lamellated corpuscles, and we'll see that again probably in another, another slide, but these are called lamellated because they look like layers of an onion. They have layers, concentric layers. I, um, those are for pressure. Loose connective tissue and adipose. So there's adipose down here. See this yellow stuff? Adipose is down here. Um, in men, the subcutaneous fat is stored around the neck, upper arms, lower back, bellies, and buttocks. In women, stored around the breast, buttocks, belly, hips, and thighs. So it's stored a little bit differently in the genders. Okay, a little bit differently from one gender to the next. Accessory structures. Here's a hair follicle. So you see a cross section here. You can see the top of the skin, the epidermis, and you can see the hair coming out. So hair follicles are downgrowths of the epidermis. So hair is an epidermal derivative. It's, a, it's made of epithelial cells. They're, they're keratinized differently, and they're packed together differently than your skin is. But they are epithelial cells that are arranged to form those fibers we call hairs. Uh, at the base of this downgrowth is a small upward projection. So it's going down, and then a little projection right there, which is right here. This is the projection right here. It's the hair papilla. They call it the dermal papilla here, but it's the hair papilla, which contains capillaries and nerves. So it doesn't really show them on this slide, but capillaries and nerves go up in here in this dermal papilla to supply nourishment and uh, oxygen and take away carbon dioxide and waste materials from this rapidly divided area here, these cells. Uh, surrounding the papilla is an enlarged mass of epithelial cells called the hair bulb. So see how it swells here? That swollen base is called the hair bulb, where it swells out, kind of like a light bulb. An area of rapidly dividing uh, cells called the matrix, and here they are here. Got some, some, uh, these are the matrix here, and, and the light purple because the browns are melanocytes. This is all the matrix here. Produces the hair. So rapidly dividing cells here are producing the new hair that you produce when one falls out. This matrix also contains melanocytes. Like I said, there's melanocytes, the brown ones. They make them brown just to show their coloring, I guess, the hair, which produce black, brown, and yellow pigments. 
White hair is due to a lack of pigment production and the presence of air bubbles in the medulla of the hair shaft. As one gets older, <clears throat> the melanocytes will die. And this is something that was really thought up about maybe 15, 20 years ago is uh, if melanoma is skin cancer and it's produced by, by melanocytes, and these melanocytes in the hair that produce pigment die when people start reaching 40 or 50, somewhere in there, what causes these cells to die? And so now there's research going on to find out what can kill melanocytes, what makes them die. If they can find that out, they may have some type of a cure for malignant melanoma, skin cancer. Uh, the central portion of a hair, which is this light area here, the center, very center of the hair, is called the medulla. It means marrow cavity or the center of some organ. So it's called the medulla. And the outer portion out here is called the cortex. <clears throat> on the hard surface is a cuticle. So this little fine little light area here is the cuticle on the outside of the hair. Okay, now these are all epithelial cells and the cuticles, the outside epithelial cells. The root of the hair extends from the bulb about halfway to the surface. So this is basically showing you the root from this little transverse plane here down. That's the root. And from that point up is the shaft of the hair. So from this halfway point to the end of the hair is called the shaft of the hair. That goes in your blank, shaft. There is an external root sheath and an internal root sheath. And the external continuation of the stratum spinosum and basal. That's going to be where it dipped down into the uh, dermis. The internal sheath uh, formed from dividing cells of the matrix. Okay, so internal here. Now let's back up and look at this. Uh, well, let's look at something first. Here is a hair cut in half. And see, there's the cortex in the middle, the medulla all around it, the cuticle around that, and then you have your follicle made up of your, uh, your follicle wall, your uh, sheaths. Here is the outside of a hair with a scanning electron micrograph picture. And you see these in women's magazines. So show this is what your hair looks like before the conditioner. And then after they use a conditioner, it's nice and smooth. So you see these epithelial cells are arranged in patterns. If the pattern is circular, that's straight hair. If the pattern is more of an oval shape, like um, this right here, if this is circular, it's straight hair. <clears throat> if the hair comes out oval, it's going to be curly hair. So here is um, a muscle. This is the, one of the models that we have in the lab, and it shows a lot of the structures in this cell, I mean, in this uh, uh, integument. And there are three parts, scalp, and you see that line there? So that's scalp over here. The middle portion is the armpit, and this one over here is the palm or sole of the foot, and I, I labeled it on the next picture. But the uh, muscle here is called erector pili muscle, and there it is, a smooth muscle, erector pili muscle. A number of smooth muscle fibers which extends from the papillary dermis to the connected tissues of the hair follicle. The hair shaft is erected during shivering, fear, and in response to emotional states. So this is what gives you goosebumps. When this hair, uh, this erector pili contracts, it makes, it makes a little bump up here, just like a muscle on your arm when you contract it. And that's, that's how you get goosebumps. Hair has the primary function of, for protection. Uh, on the head, it protects the scalp from harmful UV light. Eyelashes and eyebrows protect the eyes from foreign particles and sweat. Keep it trying to channel it away from the uh, eye. <clears throat> hair in the nostrils and ears stop particulate matter from entering those openings, like uh, things like small insects and dust from entering the two areas. Hair growth in the uh, scalp occurs for about two to five years, after which time is released from the matrix. A new hair is produced by the matrix and the old hair is pushed out of the follicle. So sometimes when you're brushing your hair, hair comes out. Well, they were loose. A new one's being formed right behind it. 
Hair growth replacement is affected by a lot of things. Illness, fever, blood loss, surgery, radiation. You know, people that are undergoing uh, radiation for cancer, they typically will lose their hair. Dieting, drugs, and childbirth. When females are pregnant, sometimes they can brush their hair and they lose a lot of hair during that, that time period. Some glands in the skin, glands of the integuments. I have them all labeled here, scalp, armpit, palm and sole of the foot. And remember I told you about the uh, lucidium? See this light area here? That's the lucidium. lucidum. Yeah, we don't ever really do that one, but it's on this one because it's the palm or sole of the foot. So <clears throat> under glands in the skin, number one, the first one there, uh, where it says oil glands, those are sebaceous glands, sebaceous glands released by way of holocrine secretion. Remember holocrine, the whole cell uh, dies and it sloughs off and it's full of secretion. A waxy, oily secretion of lipids into the hair follicles. So it, it, the cells pinch off and they're in this follicle and they are pushed out to, well, they coat the hair to condition it and they're pushed out on the surface of the skin and it gives you oily skin. So or directly to the surface of the skin. The secretion called sebum contains triglycerides, cholesterol, proteins, and electrolytes. Sebum, sebum, S-E-B-U-M, lubricates the skin and inhibits the growth of bacteria. Now don't worry about the type of gland there. Um, so that's going to be these little saddlebags on the side of the hair follicle produce a secretion called sebum, an oil. Now sweat glands produce sweat. So the first one, number one, is apocrine sweat glands. And there it is right there. And you see it's in the armpit <clears throat> or located in the axilla. That's your armpit, the pubic region and the areola of the breast. The secretions are discharged from the gland by myoepithelial cells. Myo is muscle. So it's a special type of a cell that we're not going to really uh, mention beyond this, which surrounds the gland and contracts to discharge sweat from the gland. Bacteria can use this secretion as a nutrient source and produce odiferous byproducts. Um, it's called uh, Staphylococcus hominis. That's the uh, bacteria. And this type of sweat uh, they use and produce odiferous byproducts that we call body odor. That's why you use antiperspirants and uh, deodorants to kill the bacteria and prevent the sweat from being um, used by the bacteria to make your odiferous body products. Uh, number two is eccrine, eccrine glands. They're also called merocrine, M-E-R-O-C-R-I-N-E. -E. So eccrine or merocrine sweat glands. Also called sulfurous sweat glands, sulfurous sweat glands. They're most numerous in the palms of the hands and soles of the feet. Okay. They function in cooling um, the surface of the body to reduce temperature, excreting excess water and electrolytes and inhibiting bacterial growth because sweat, when it goes across the surface of the body, will trap bacteria and then it falls off in the sweat. Some other glands, um, mammary glands of the breast are a type of modified apocrine sweat gland and ceruminous glands, C-E-R-U-M-I-N-O-U-S. Glands are also a type of modified sweat gland which produces a waxy secretion called cerumen. That's your earwax. The cerumen inside the uh, external auditory canal, that's your ear hole, inhibits bacterial growth, traps particulate matter, and the hairs prevent small insects from entering the ears. Now we have the nails. So we have several things to look at here. Nails are also epidermal derivatives. They are also stratified squamous epithelial cells that are heavily keratinized and packed very densely to form your nails. Down at the ends of fingers and toes. They're clear, hard, heavily keratinized cells of the epidermis. <clears throat> now your first blank is the nail bed. There it is. It's underneath the nail, called the nail bed, the epidermis below the nail. 
the root of the nail is the base end where it's being formed. So the nail root, the hidden base of the nail, the body of the nail is the part that you see. The body of the nail is what you see, the main portion of the nail. The nail matrix, remember matrix is rapidly dividing cells that are going to produce the nail, okay, heavily keratinized cells. So an area at the base of the nail which was responsible for nail growth. Now the cuticle, here it is up here, a portion of the stratum corneum which extends over the root of the nail, also called the uh, eponychium. It's a EPO, you know, eponychium, that's how they pronounce that. It means upon the nail. So that's your cuticle. When you look at the top of the nail, people have different um, sizes of lunula. L-U-N-U-L-A. Lunula. It means a little moon, a little crescent moon. So it's a little whitening at the base of the nail there, you can see. White crescent at the base of the cuticle. The nail folds. Here's a lateral nail fold on the sides. Nail folds. You have nail groove in your notes, uh, unless I change it to nail folds. The furrow at the junction of the nail fold and the nail bed. So it's that little area there on either side. Look at the tip. It's called the free edge of the nail. That's the part you have to uh, use fingernail clippers on all the time, the free edge. The portion of the nail that extends beyond the digit. And the area below, look at the far right here, hyponychium is the area under the nail. This is where you have like dirt collects under your nails. It's that space. And that's all we have for uh, this lecture on the integumentary system.